We all know that atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But what you might not know is that electrons are a lot more interesting than the classical theory that they are just tiny particles orbiting around a nucleus. Today we're going to talk about the four quantum numbers and how they're used to model the modern atomic atom. So we're going to start today with three of the pillars of quantum theory which as it concerns us right now is simply just the mathematical and empirical basis for the modern atomic atom. So number one is that electrons are confined to discrete energy levels. Now this is actually a topic that classical theory and quantum theory agree on. And below this I have a diagram that is definitely a classical model. This is the solar system model of an atom. And what it shows is that the electrons clearly exist in different energy levels. You see that n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, and that can actually keep going all the way until or as n approaches infinity. And even though I say that quantum theory and classical theory agree on this, you're going to see in points 2 and 3 how this particular solar system model is not at all what an atom actually looks like. But you will see this model time and time again simply because it does a great job of showing that electrons are confined to discrete energy levels. But then we move on to point two and that is that we can quantify the energy and position of electrons using the very very famous Schrodinger equation. So we give energy its own term and we call that n or what we'll talk about later as the principal quantum number and that's simply energy level it's any whole number integer up until infinity. However, and this is where we really start deviating from the model above, is that the Schrodinger equation actually gave us the position of electrons and not as a single position but a big range of positions. So if your electron can exist in multiple states, then your position is actually a range of positions, and that range of position ultimately gives us the shape of an electron orbital. And those specific shapes are outlined in step three, which is that electrons have cloud-like orbits around the nucleus. So quantum theory said that we're no longer looking at electrons as these tiny little particles floating around in circular or elliptical orbits around the nucleus, like planets orbit around the sun, rather the electrons exist in these clouds and they can exist all spread around in this three-dimensional structure that would look like a sphere or a dumbbell shape, something that ultimately becomes a lot more complex. And so you see right here the modern atomic model and notice how different it is. But one thing remains very, very consistent is that no matter what your orbitals look like, no matter how complex they become, you're still going to have electrons in discrete energy levels. And that's where we start with the quantum numbers. So the first quantum number is the principal quantum number. It's what we've been talking about already which is n, and that is just the size or the energy of an orbital. And once again, n can be any whole number integer up through infinity. The second quantum number is angular momentum, and I just call this L. And L is that extremely important indicator of the shape of an orbital. So L can be 0, 1, 2, any whole number value up until n minus 1. You will never have an L value that is equal to your n value. And one thing that's really important about the angular momentum quantum number is that the value actually represents a shape. And so if you have L is equal to 0, for example, that is an s orbital. And we see an s orbital right here. It's just a sphere. And so if L is equal to zero, what you are saying is that your electron orbital shape is a sphere. 
And then if L is equal to one, that means your shape is going to be a P orbital and your P orbitals are all right here. And then you can get into more complex shapes. And so you can give L is equal to two and that would be a D orbital. Or you can do L is equal to three and that's an F orbital. And technically you can go L is equal to four is G, L equals five is H, all the way down the alphabet for as long as you want. But what I want you to notice here is let's go back to these P orbitals. Once you get to L is equal to one or L is equal to two, L is equal to three, etc., you can actually come up with different orientations. It's not just a simple sphere where with any S orbital, you only have one way you can arrange a sphere. But if you have that dumbbell shape of the P orbital, you can actually arrange it on the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis, which is three dimensional, of course. And we actually describe that mathematically with the magnetic quantum number, which is number three. And that's going to be M sub L. And that is simply the orientation of an orbital. And that number range will always go from negative L to L. So in the case of your P orbital, you have L is equal to one. So your M sub L could be negative one, zero, and one. That's three different orientations. And as you can see here, that represents the three orientations of the P orbital. So really nice to see how all that comes together. Lastly is the spin magnetic quantum number M sub S, and that's gonna be the spin of an electron in an orbital. You can fit two electrons in each particular orbital. So what the spin magnetic quantum number is saying is that if you had an orbital, let me just write it out, the 1s orbital, and I wanted to put an electron in there, that would be a positive spin. So if I wanted to put another electron in there, it would have to have a negative one half spin. And this quantum number, there's no way to really determine what it is without doing some heavy duty math or some observation. So all you really need to know is that the possible values for M sub S are gonna be plus one half or minus one half. For now, both of those are proper responses. So a quick recap that I want you to see is that when we're talking about the principal quantum number, this is gonna be this entire shell. So all of these orbitals that I have in this drawing, let's just call this n is equal to two. And so that's gonna contain everything that's in that n energy level. And notice how as we go down in these quantum numbers, we're getting more and more specific. So for your angular momentum quantum number, that's gonna represent maybe your two s. It's gonna be that s component. So what that means is that L is equal to zero. Similarly, if I'm looking at any of these, these are all gonna be my two p, and this p, means that L is equal to one. As I get a little bit more specific, my magnetic quantum number is saying that I have three different orientations. My L is equal to one. So my M sub L can be equal to negative one, zero, or one. But remember for this S orbital, because L is equal to zero, my M sub L can only be negative L to L, which is just zero. So that means there's one possible orientation. And lastly, my spin magnetic quantum number is basically saying that any electrons in any of these orientations, orbitals, or levels can have a plus or minus spin. And for now, we're not gonna go past that. So I hope that this was able to explain why these quantum numbers exist. That is something that a lot of students brush over. And so they don't fully understand why the quantum numbers represent things like the size, the shape, the orientation. They only know the rules. But I do want to remind you that for introductory chemistry and standardized tests such as the MCAT, all you really need to know are the rules. And so if you do know the rules, you will get most of the way in any of your courses or standardized exams. 
However, I do recommend taking the time to understand why these rules exist because it is profoundly important for understanding the modern atomic model.